the team safe. Can you guys all say team stay on three? One, two, three. Team Hi, I'm Mary Ann. Welcome to Team Say. Today is Friday the 13th, but it's your lucky day because with us we have Dr. Martha White. And as I often refer to her when I tell people about her, the best allergist in the country. And I'm not kidding. Wait till you hear her story for the medical journey. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And you are with the Institute for Asthma and Allergy now. I got that right. That's yes. correct. Oh, that is absolutely correct. <laughs> Institute for Asthma and Allergy. <laughs> My son came to you, and he had some serious allergies at the time. And, uh, you know, often people are very troubled with medical illness before they find exactly what's ailing them and hurting them and making them sick. And so he thinks you're a genius, right? Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he thought about becoming an allergist and he said to you, well, what does it take to become an allergist? So thus mom's thinking, hmm, the medical journey. So we are hearing from all of you to hear how difficult or easy the journey was. And what we found was everybody has a very unique story. And then you started to tell us your story and yours is even more unique than I had thought. I mean, you hear things about uh, the past that you don't really, I mean, I guess I just never heard anyone say it. So the way you did. So we'd love to hear your journey. Um, you wanna get started? Okay. Tell us. Well, actually, um, I was a dancer when I was in high school and, and grade school. Actually, I started out as a piano teacher, I mean, as a piano oh. player. Um, and I had a teacher who used to spank my hands every time I made a mistake. Oh. And I started dancing, and my parents gave me the choice, one or the other. Easy choice, became a dancer, and right. um, danced every day in high school and much of college. And of just the jumble of our toe shoes. This was the Virginia Ballet Theater, which was a company that I danced with 50 years ago. It says, support the most complete dance outside. center outside New York. Wow. Um, but yeah, I used to dance, I took, well I danced so every night and would come and take, wow. yeah. Would come and take uh, classes with the younger kids too. My patients oftentimes talk about uh, my posture and there's, there's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> They'll say I come gliding into the room. Well, it's because I spent most of my time in ballet shoes. Either doing this or studying. Actually, I found if you're really, really busy, you're a much better student because you're you get quite efficient. My decision uh, was to go to New York and be a dancer or go to medical school. And initially, wow. <laughs> That's initially I didn't want medical school. Initially, I wanted to be a vet. Oh. But I'm allergic to animals. Okay. So I settled for humans. Wow. And I wanted medical school because I didn't want some nurse telling me what, some doctor telling me what to do all the time. So I was going to be the doctor. So guess what? Now I'm a doctor and a nurse and an insurance company tells me what I can do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's been a it's been a wonderful journey. Um, the unique for, part that the, I found was. Was what you said about not being able to go in to medical school because oh, you were a female. That. Okay, so in oh, high school, I, I worked for a cardiologist. I actually had the pleasure of starting out in the dog labs with um, Rick Lauer, who invented the the technique for um, for heart transplants. Wow! And then worked in cardiac cath lab. And when I applied for medical school. I was turned down the first year, and they, they told the person I worked with that I was way too cute and feminine. I would never practice medicine. Wow. And um, not my something. family, of course, was upset, and they wanted me to sue. And I said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I want them to like me. <laughs> so I just yeah. applied the next year and got in. Uh, but that's, that's what it was back then. I, I graduated in 78. Um, when I entered medical school, there were six women in the yeah. medical school class that was graduating. In my class, I think there were 36, 36 women, 164 students, I think 24 African-Americans. Um, 
very, very different statistics now. Yeah. More than 50%. I and think could you imagine even. today mm -hmm. if they got a hold of that they weren't letting you into medical school because you were feminine and beautiful and cute? Well, oh, I don't think that would happen goodness. these days. Um, so the biggest thing kids say is, it's so hard. So I guess, when did you, so a few questions. When did you decide that you wanted to become a doctor? Oh gosh. How uh, old were you? Roughly. I'm not sure. Probably middle school. Certainly by wow. the time I was a freshman, I knew I wanted to go into medicine. Okay. As I said early on, it was I wanted to be a vet until I figured out that that just was not in the cards as, as somebody who had allergies to animals. Um, but all through high school, I knew I wanted to go to medical school. And in fact, did you keep your grades up because you knew that? Did well, you have I kept a different my grades system? up just because I kept my grades up. Okay. Um, I had a reputation in high school of only dating the smartest guys in the class, and we all went to medical school. <laughs> I mean, okay. all the guys that I dated and Ed myself. Um, See, now I've heard a joke about that. Uh -huh. They say all the smart girls usually go out with the dumb guys. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well. I probably anyway. had one or two of them like that. <laughs> the journey itself. Um, was it the regular journey, go from high school to med hey, school? Liz is here to join you. Hi, well, Liz. okay, so I said that I was allergic to animals. I became an allergist and desensitized myself. And this little fella, give me a razor. Everybody wants to see you. Oh, here we go. So this is what becoming an allergist or going to an allergist lets you do. I've had as many as three pets at the same time. Wow. Um, but you were asking. So the medical journey for you, um, did that entail, you skipped a year, I guess, before you went from high school Skipped a year, to worked in medical medicine. school. Mm -hmm. um, and then four years of medical school, it was... Um, so you did take the typical road. I took the typical road, four years. Uh, I thought it was going to be super hard. I uh, stopped all of my extracurricular activities. I stopped dancing. Oh. Uh, figuring that it was just going to be terribly hard, and yeah, it wasn't any worse, I suppose, than, than college. Yes. So tell us a little about your journey. So you're in high school, and you mentioned a few jobs. What, what were you, now you knew you wanted to be a doctor, so did you have, did you go for a specific job with doctors? Actually, in high school, I danced almost every day. Wow, that I makes was, you a lot happier, right? That's right. Um, kept me off the streets for sure. Yeah. I was a teen model. Um, wow. And my summer jobs were in the cardiac cath lab. So I was actually lucky wow. enough to work with the person who developed the technique for heart transplants and one of his partners who did cardiac catheterizations. Um, I didn't end up going into cardiology, obviously. Um, right. But it was one of the things I thought about. Um, and then from there, for college, every year when I came back, I worked in the cath lab, so I stayed in medicine. And weren't you a dance teacher as well? Um, that's how I paid for medical school. My sister used to teach dance in a little town called Tappahannock um, in Virginia. And around the time I started medical school, she got otherwise occupied, so I took over the studio. Wow. And our medical school allowed us off every Wednesday so that we could make money. Huh. So I would drive down to Tappahannock, run a dance school, and that was enough to be able to pay what tuition I needed to pay just you know, over and above the scholarship I had. That's amazing. And today they offer so many different you know, programs that can make medical school affordable. Because I guess a few people that I've heard uh, turn away from medical school, they have said, oh, well, we don't want to you know, leave school with like $500,000. <laughs> so, it's expensive. Yeah. It, it really it is. is. But it's obtainable, right? Um, yes. There's lots of programs they can go for. So, um, okay. So then back to your journey. Um, so you were teaching dance and you were in school. Was it? Teaching dance in school. Um, that's, that's a I, lot. They, they say, I had a PA say that during PA school, they do not work. I had thought that medical school would be hard enough that I would have to stop all my extracurricular activities. So I yeah. actually stopped working with the dance company that I, that I danced with at the time. Um, as it turned out I probably could have continued to dance, but maybe just as well I didn't. Yeah. I was able to keep the grades up and you know get the the residencies that I wanted. So where did you go to medical school? 
Medical College of Virginia, otherwise now known as Virginia Commonwealth University. Okay. And I did my pediatric residency there as well. So the choices at that time were pediatrics or psychiatry. Uh-huh. Um, wow. I, I like, <laughs> okay, they're not all that terribly, <laughs> not that terribly different, but um, I ended up in, in pediatrics. And from there, um, decided on allergy. You know, I looked at various fields. I looked at, I like doing things with my hands. Uh -huh. I like uh, immunology and mechanisms. So I looked at uh, endocrinology, a lot of, yeah. a lot of mechanisms there, allergy and GI mm -hmm. and cardiology were the four things that I was most interested in and decided yeah. on allergy. And actually, if you look at most allergists, I'd say probably 80% of us have allergies ourselves. So we've heard that. Yeah. That you yeah. usually go into the field. <laughs> you go into the field that you have some personal interest in. We yeah. with my animal allergies, of course. Um, and as an allergist, and putting myself on allergy shots, I now have dogs. We've had as many as three. That's great because yeah. it makes you so relatable to your patients. And you understand when yes. they come to you and say, yeah. I don't want to get rid of my dog. And you're like, okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> allergy shots, 95% of us get better on them. So. They work well if you actually have allergies. Wow. And so you were at NIH for a while? I was for about We're going to show a picture of the NIH, um, I guess it's the campus? The campus, an aerial view. It's actually about maybe two miles from here. Ah, okay. um, Yes. We're going to show that, was, that, and that is beautiful. That is in your living room. It's beautiful. It is. When I left, I got uh, an aerial view, and then um, people signed a copy for me. I think what I have in the living room is just the aerial view, but that was nine lovely years of doing um, immunology research and running the, the pediatric part of the allergy training program. Wow. And then when I left the NIH, I, uh, my partner and I started the Institute for Asthma and Allergy and I ran the research program there as well as uh, saw patients. So uh, does it take longer to become an allergist than a, like, so you graduate medical school you graduate medical school, you do your residency. So okay. for me, it was pediatrics, that's three years. Okay. And then the allergy fellowship um, was an additional two years at Georgetown. So allergy is unique in that you can either have a pediatric or a medicine background, medicine being adult mm -hmm. medicine. Um, and then in the allergy fellowship, you learn to take care of both pediatric and adult allergy patients. And so I've had the pleasure of being able to take care of entire families. You, your children. I have yeah. some families where I have four generations. Wow. That I've taken care of all of those same yeah. times. I think you've taken care of my mother as well. That's right, I have. None of your kids have kids yet. So, uh, <laughs> That's true. That, that would be the fourth generation. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> um, and you are also, I guess because of NIH, you were the, um, we had you on Dr. Libby's World of Medicine, the show I used to produce um, for the allergy shot. So when I met you, we came to you because my nephew, who was allergic to milk and everything like the boy in the plastic bubble, um, came to you and had a unique shot that you were doing research on. Do you want to tell us about that shot? Yes, and now well, he can eat everything, and he's an adult, and thank God yes. he didn't die from anaphylaxis. Jamie had very severe milk allergies, and at the time that I met him, I was running a research trial on Zolaire. Uh, generic name is Omalizumab, but Zolaire is used for asthma, um, urticaria, otherwise known as hives, but um, oh. <laughs> I enrolled that was him a lot because, simpler. <laughs> that's right, I enrolled him because he has asthma, but I was looking specifically not only for asthmatic kids, but kids who had food allergies, because um, I thought probably it would work well, in food allergy as well. He was so severe that if we had coffee with milk in it and we kissed his cheek, he would have problems. Party, mm -hmm. Yeah, he was literally getting an EpiPen and fly into the hospital, so he, it was very He would sad. go to the hospital with yeah. very um, small exposures. And it was and so discovered sad. Yeah, he was so right. loving, and you know, he wanted to be picked up, he wanted everybody to kiss him and hold him, and people just didn't want to because they didn't want to cause an allergic reaction, like, did I wash my hands? Did I eat that cookie? Did that have nuts in it? And family parties for my sister were very difficult. I can mm. well imagine, um, yeah. but we learned that that when Jamie had accidental exposures to milk, as he always did at least twice a year uh, while he was on this trial, nothing happened. 
That's amazing. So um, it, that, it was a real game changer for him. Yeah. He's, uh, he's an adult now, and I, yeah. I think, as you say, he's now eating pretty much anything he wants to. Yeah. Uh, but that drug has been a game changer for um, a lot of patients. It's not approved for food allergy, um, although it's been studied. That and very similar products are being studied in food allergy. Wow. But we did. So we uh, worked on his food allergies, but you put him on it for his asthma. The study was for pediatric asthma. And he wow. was actually the first patient in, in the country who was dosed in that particular trial. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and it really was a game changer. So, wonderful. Yeah, but we did. Uh, I'm I imagine to when he has kids, they'll be coming. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, it does run in families. So, we've yeah. done over 200 clinical trials. I'd say probably about 225, 250. Wow. So, pretty much everything that's on the market right now for asthma and allergy, my patients have helped to put on the market. That's great. Your family has participated. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's incredible. We might be able to show a clip. There's also some research that's being done on Zolaire, which is um, a medication given by injection that's available for severe asthma. Um, it's blocks IgE, which is the allergy molecule. And so it's being looked at as well for treatment of food allergies. Yeah, and we'll talk to someone here who actually uh, had the experience of, of using Zolaire. It, give us a little perspective. I guess you're the one who probably enrolled him in the first place. Mm -hmm. That started at, at what age and he was having what kinds of symptoms that you were trying <coughs> to correct or trying to treat? He was having frequent reactions um, uh, and he's asthmatic, so the shot was actually meant for the asthma, okay. but with a beautiful side effect. It is definitely the miracle drug. Yeah, um, I'm actually four years without an EpiPen or inhaler. Um, I can eat everything that I was allergic to, and um, I'm fine. I actually had salmon for lunch, and <laughs> no reaction. Wow, that's fantastic. When we talk about allergy in general, uh, there are lots of conceptions and misconceptions, but give us a little basic primer on what allergies are. Well, allergy is an inherited condition. We're not actually born with allergies, but we're born with the ability to develop an allergy. And in order to have that happen, you have to be exposed. So for a person genetically able to develop an allergy to, say, milk, once you get exposed to a certain amount of milk at a certain age, you develop this little molecule called IgE. It's a little Y-shaped molecule that then recognizes milk. And then when you get exposed to it again, it Release, it causes a mast cell in the body to release histamine and other goodies <laughs> that then causes allergic reactions. You can also have allergic reactions to cats, ragweed. Most of us have some sort of allergy to something in, in the environment. Um, but food allergies can be particularly scary. Uh, you can have respiratory problems. You can have a rash, um, abdominal problems. Sometimes people will even get a stuffy nose from a food allergy. But it can be life-threatening. So, and, and just to explore that IgE um, issue, so you have certain cells that line the respiratory tract, they're inside your eyes and your conjunctiva and in your nose mm -hmm. and those areas. And, and of course, the simple one being the pollen, they recognize that pollen and it causes those cells to release irritating things that make those symptoms. Basically, yes. They're called mast cells and they're everywhere, but mostly in our skin and then mucous membranes. So the gut, the nose, the lungs, the eyes, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, and histamine, I guess, the chemicals. Histamine is one of, of the major chemicals that gets released during an allergic reaction. There are other chemicals as well, but we're all familiar with the word antihistamine. Right. Um, antihistamines block the effect of histamine. Right. So, therefore, that's why they have all those allergy medicines on the counter that certainly we all tend to think whenever we have a runny nose, maybe it's allergy, and we take one of those, it's going to make it all better, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. But just Starting with, with you, when did you, did you ever know that you would be an allergic person? How could you ever know that, right? I never knew that I would ever be allergic to peanut until my mom gave me peanut butter on a celery stick. I think I was three. Three. Yeah, and I got an allergic reaction to it. I stopped breathing and I got hives. Wow. Well, I guess you didn't even know to get scared at that point. Mm. But I bet you did. Very scared. Yeah. Very scared. Didn't know what was going on. First child, 
you know, well, like everybody else, you try new food and peanut butter was, it was actually at the age of one to introduce peanut butter. Right. And uh, she had a, you know, blisters on the lips and then broke out in hives and stopped breathing and wow. scary, scary experience. So did, did you have any inclination to think that you could have allergies in the family? Do you have allergies yourself? I don't have allergies. Mom? M uh, her side does. Her side does. Okay. She says my side, I say her side. Right, okay. <laughs> we, we take both parts. Somebody's getting blamed for this. Exactly. Right. And there are other kinds of um, confusing symptoms that people think are food allergies. Uh, lactose intolerance, things like that. Right. Well, lactose intolerance is an inability to digest milk. And so people with lactose intolerance, when they eat milk or ice cream, um, cheese, will get a bloated stomach, there's a lot of pain, and you can get those same symptoms with an actual allergy. But the difference is that with the lactose intolerance, um, they might be able to tolerate a tiny amount of it. Um, the skin test and the blood test will be negative. And you can actually eat the enzyme at the same time as the food and be able to tolerate the food. Not so with, with a food allergy. That needs to be taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. you know, lactose intolerance might make you wish you were dead, but a food allergy will make <laughs> you dead. <laughs> You're, you have one who's had an episode. Yeah, her very first was her very full first blown episode. anaphylaxis. Yep. Yeah, and I think for parents too, um, your reaction and how you treat the allergy sometimes is governed by if you've actually seen anaphylaxis or not, because it's easier to be in a little bit of a denial and to say, oh, well, we just have a mild food allergy. And um, I like to say there's no such thing as a mild food allergy yeah. because your past reactions don't predict your future reactions. So, you know, for the past 10 years, you may have only had mild reactions. It doesn't mean you don't have the potential to have a very severe reaction, which is why it is so important to always carry your epinephrine auto injector because yeah. Benadryl won't save your life. Right epinephrine will save your life. And your interest in this has evolved. Um, you've gotten very much involved. Uh, I have, yeah. you know, I, um, I was a practicing attorney. That was my first professional life. And now I have a second professional life. I work at FAN um, doing all sorts of education programs in schools. And I started by doing a program for teachers and it's called Everything an educator should know about food allergies. Yeah. Very basic because that interaction when a parent comes to a teacher to say, here's an epinephrine auto injector, you know, here's my five year old, you may have to save her life. It's such an uncomfortable um, yeah. dialogue on both sides. You know, the parent is terrified that you're leaving your child in the hands of someone who doesn't know what to do. And the teacher may be terrified if they don't know anything about food allergies. Oh my gosh, this is a big responsibility. And um, it's not you know, rocket science, it's, it's doable. It's infinitely doable to keep kids safe at school. You just gotta know the basics. Right. It's easier in the house. You can pretty much keep your house uh, in pretty good shape. But grandparents' house is tougher. Yeah, I would imagine. Schools we talked about, yeah. and restaurants, because you don't always know what the ingredients are. And so what FAN tries to do is give people advice so that they can lead about as normal a life as you can. And we do have somebody who's been very kind to, to at least to a lot of allergic uh, patients. Sure, there. it's never a problem. You I mean, most people come into the restaurant, it's usually for milk, eggs, dairy. And for us, we just learned over experience that we can easily do it by sanitizing the area when we're making pizzas, because that's usually what we make. Have a sanitized area for them, put them through, it's never a problem. And if you're a restaurant manager, an entrepreneur, know what's in your food. Right. Check and see. I mean, when people come in for eggs, don't do dressings. Oil and vinegar always works well. Get extra volatile. Uh, excuse me, <clears throat> olive oil, vinegar, it's never a problem for them. We'll yeah, I guess they do. <laughs> it's, it's not great when they're trying to breathe and eat. No, my <laughs> sister's a diabetic, so trust me, I know what okay, happens all right. real fast. Well, it's great that you have a restaurant where you're sensitive to those issues, and uh, we thank you for being here. No and, problem. And bringing us the snacks that you make at Easily your restaurant. Easily done. Out in Chantilly, that's great, that's great. Um, the, the number that's been quoted recently is up to about 4% of Americans have food allergies, 11 million people. Right. And as the doctor says, we're not surely, maybe you can speak more about it, but we don't really know why. Is it we're too clean? Right. We're overly immunized? Right. And we just know it's going on the rise. And then that's why groups like the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network was created, because you've got parents around here who all say, gee, my kid has it, my kid has it. So we've become the central place for people to go with a website, foodallergy.org. We have recipes on there. There's a kids uh, program. Sam here is involved in the teen program. So 
what parents need is education awareness because we don't have treatments yet and we don't really have any cures. So we've got symptoms that you've described. You've had hives, you've um, had airway problems. Yeah, my airway would close off. Um, my face would swell, I would get hives, um, I would turn all sorts of different colors. Uh, um, it, it, it was pretty ridiculous. Pretty um, dramatic. Yeah. yeah. So we've heard gastrointestinal symptoms, we've heard um, actually uh, according to what the history is that he actually went into shock at some point. When we're talking about uh, these kinds of reactions, what are the types of things that we generally categorize as food related symptoms? Allergies. Oh, it can be anything. So the most dangerous would be shock, which means that your blood pressure drops enough that you can't stay conscious, um, and that's life-threatening. The other uh, reaction that's life-threatening would be airway problems. Mm -hmm. You can get the same swelling that you see in the lips or the skin can happen internally if that happens around the throat. Um, it closes off the airway. You can't breathe. You can have a very bad asthma attack again from swelling within um, the airways. Uh, we see skin. So you can get swelling, you can get hives. Um, eczema very commonly is caused uh, by food allergies. Um, and then the GI manifestations. Some people will even get diarrhea. They may have to run to the bathroom. I've even seen people with uterine contractions. You know, wow. feel basically like what happens when you're trying to have a baby. So anaphylaxis, um, we've heard that there are symptoms you get with certain food allergic experiences, but what qualifies it as anaphylaxis? Well, anaphylaxis is a body-wide or systemic reaction. Um, and it's usually manifest by, most people have skin, um, flushing, hives. Um, but they also would have either airway problems, uh, GI problems, or, um, or blood pressure. And the scary things would be loss of blood pressure or shock or airway closure. Um, and those are immediately life-threatening. And as was mentioned, you never know how quickly or how far a reaction is going to go. And so I always tell my patients that if they notice anything at all, that they use that EpiPen because you don't want to wait until you feel like you or your child is going to die before you pull out that EpiPen and actually use it because the difference between the person who survives a bad allergic reaction or an anaphylactic reaction is how fast they got that first shot of adrenaline, which is what's in your epinephrine auto-injector. Okay, so anaphylaxis sounds like a pretty unpleasant experience. Very. And pretty <laughs> and scary, scary for any of those who might be observing it. And of course, uh, as we were hearing, uh, even uh, those who are responsible for being able to see if that happens, uh, that's a pretty big responsibility. Uh, are there, let's say, in the worst of situations, people can die from anaphylaxis? Oh, absolutely. It should be. It is know. not. It's a totally preventable um, problem. Because it's a totally preventable problem once the diagnosis is made. There's always that first reaction, and nobody's expected to have an epinephrine auto injector or know how to take care of themselves with that first reaction. And the first reaction can be lethal. But, but once the diagnosis is made, avoidance and administration of adrenaline is life threatening. And it's a real shame when somebody succumbs to an allergic reaction to a food once they've been given that EpiPen. So something uh, on the horizon, something to look forward to. Um, I know you work with Dr. White. That is correct. And what do you do there? I'm one of her assistants. I work in the clinic and I do um, skin testing. I'm responsible for blood draws as well for the children. Um, and so you, you, you had some skin testing. I actually do. These are called our duo tip devices, mm -hmm. which is a plastic little device that we just basically, a simple scratch on the skin with the actual food that we're testing to and then we wait for about 15, 20 minutes and see if there's a reaction to the food. So much like we were talking about before, we have these histamine reactions. That is they, correct. They just swell up into like a mosquito a bite. mosquito bite and lots of redness around it. That is correct. Right. Which and we call. You mm -hmm. measure it and it's all relative to how big you it is. Based on the size. That's yeah. correct. Wow, mm -hmm. interesting. And then, of course, you also have that life-saving device. That is correct, yes. which is called an EpiPen. All right. So, and <laughs> it's... I guess the first thing that ends up happening in that office is that every time that you you have a real bona fide diagnosis, do you prescribe an EpiPen? Absolutely. Okay. And and actually, um, the EpiPen needs to be wherever the person with the allergy is. So for children, and I get a lot of kickback from insurance companies on this, but I'm a 
very strong believer for, that for children there needs to be EpiPens at school, needs to be at home, in the backpack, babysitter if they go someplace for after school care. Um, but yes, everybody who has the potential for anaphylaxis gets an EpiPen. So we had a, an instance where we were, we had outgrown my son's allergy, we thought, to milk. Um, everybody cleared him and then all of a sudden, lo and behold, a year later, um, a couple of years later, he was getting um, stomach aches, chest pains. We said, oh, it's just anxiety to school, leave him in school rushed him to the doctor a pediatrician a few times and he was having anaphylaxis symptoms um not needing an epipen but just had um, i guess wheezing going on and different things um and then we came to you and lo and behold even though they were doing a ras test which was just a blood test to check for allergies we found that once you did a skin test it popped so it had what you do is you put the skin test and the RAS test together and then do your numbers. Do you want to tell us a little about that? Because we found out that's why he was getting pneumonia. So why okay, does well, it work that way? <laughs> well, a skin test is, is looking at a physiological response. So when you have an allergy, your body makes this little Y-shaped molecule called IgE. Okay. Um, and that IgE, the, the Y part of it, um, attaches to whatever you're allergic to. In his case, it was milk. Okay. The bottom part attaches to a mast cell in the skin, the gut, the nose, wherever, uh, chest. Okay. Um, and then when he would be exposed to milk, mm -hmm. it would attach to his IgE and cause his mast cells to react. Right. When you do a blood test, you're looking for that IgE that's floating around in the bloodstream. So uh, it's two different ways of looking at things. One, one is physiological, the other is a, a blood test. Um, and usually the two correlate, but not always. And so occasionally I'll have patients who have completely negative blood, right. but still react. Hmm. And he was one. But when we really do want to evaluate these children, at what age can we start to do some real defined allergy testing? You can actually start allergy testing in the first few months of life if you need to. Um, and I think it's important to try to figure out a diagnosis. But it's also important for people to understand that there's two different types of allergy testing. There's a skin test that we do, um, and then there's also a blood test. And sometimes, especially in little people, I get a different answer from the skin test than I do from the blood test. So normally I like to look at both um, so that we can be sure that we don't miss anything. The other thing to remember is that sometimes um, we'll get a very low positive on the blood test for a food that somebody's able to eat and they tolerate well. And the bottom line is if you can eat a food and absolutely nothing happens, then you're not allergic to it. Um, you digest a food, so what goes in the mouth doesn't necessarily correspond to what gets absorbed um, from the gut and into the bloodstream. And what we test with is what would originally go into the mouth. Okay, so and that's important to know because I think that people might get very frightened and they'll see symptoms and they'll eliminate very important and nutritious foods from their child's diet. So they, they really do need to know, number one, what it is that, that they need to eliminate mm -hmm. for the safety of the child and their, their general state of health, but also to make sure that they know what they need to feed that baby for nutritional purposes. Yeah, that was so strange. I was just amazed. So I remember him saying, um, <laughs> when he was young, um, one of his doctors retired and he said, Dr. White can't retire. I'll die. <laughs> so uh, we drove to Maryland to see you all the time from Virginia. And I remember the kids could just go to the pediatrician's office for a normal cold that would turn into sinusitis, umpty visits to the pediatrician, you know, and inhalers and this and that, and just got it so out of control. And what I found was, you know, when kids have those reactions to regular colds, it's time to go to Dr. White <laughs> versus the regular pediatrician. And that's what I've been trying to tell a lot of new moms now that when their kids are constantly dealing with being on antibiotics and very sick or ear infection after ear infection or reflux even, and they're treating for reflux, that it's usually an allergy. Yeah, it actually it's interesting that you mentioned the correlation between allergy and infections. So mm -hmm. allergy is an inflammatory disorder. Okay. So what happens is your mast cells, when they start getting activated, they also act 
act in, they also activate other inflammatory cells in the body. And the receptor for the cold virus actually uh -huh. gets upregulated during allergic inflammation. Okay. Makes so sense. people who have allergies are more likely to get colds than people who don't have allergies that are active. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, one of the things that we notice when we get kids' asthma under control or put them on allergy shots and get their allergies healed is they stop getting sick so much. That's the lesson. Um, yes. The other thing is that when you have nasal allergies, mm -hmm. the lining of the nose and the lining of the sinuses get inflamed mm -hmm. and swollen and it closes off the drainage hole for the sinuses so it sets you up for a sinus infection because the mucus we make can't get out. So it's stuck up in here right. um, and then you get sick more. So the two do go hand in hand a lot. Yeah, they do, definitely. So if a, a teenager, junior, senior year, mm -hmm. has no idea, but they're like, wow, it would be really cool to be a doctor, and they have good grades, or maybe not, you know, not a 4.0, but maybe a 3.5, and they're just playing with it, how do they, how do they know? Like, most doctors I've talked to seem to, did you, you just knew. I mean, I knew, but not everybody does. Okay. So if you're not sure, you've got good grades, mm -hmm. um, I'd say look at what you really enjoy doing. Look find at your passion. You How like. do find you find your passion? your passion? Yeah. Yeah. Don't choose something because it looks like it's a good career. Choose something because you're going to enjoy it. Because money. if you don't enjoy it, yeah, and you you're, can't. you're just not going to be good at it and you're going to be miserable. Right. Um, and also for the money, if they're looking at a if career you're at as a doctor. For the money, Forget it. You know, yeah. I mean, you're it's the wrong motivation, and you're not going to be happy in what you're doing, even if you're good at it. Right. So, um, what was you, your motivation? Oh, I wanted to help people. Yeah. Um, the money wasn't actually all that important. And from I mean, what I've heard, is you're starving during, well, uh, you know, the years you're putting your hours in before medical school. <laughs> Okay, so my internship <laughs> yeah, was not paid, right? Uh, no, you get paid for internships, but, oh. but you work, well, maybe not anymore because they changed the rules, right. but when I was an intern, yeah. I was on call overnight every, every third night. Wow. So I would work around the clock from like 7 in the morning until maybe 6 or 7 the next day. Wow. Get to go home and go to bed. Um, the next night I could go to bed and then... And then wow. I would get to do it all over again. And I remember my sister telling me, oh, you should dress better. You're a rich doctor. Well, I was making, when you figured it up, $11, 11 cents an hour. Or maybe it was $1.10 an hour. Oh, it was some ridiculously yeah. small amount yeah. of money per, per hour. Um, so no, I didn't yeah. do that for the money at all. But, uh, and I heard a few of the, the PA, you know, the girls wanting to go to PA school, uh -huh. that they're working as EMTs in the ER for like $15 an hour to put in their 2,000 hours, and they're working their butts off, but mm -hmm. you know, they're making $15 an hour and then taxes come out, so. And they have this degrees, they have bachelor degrees, so. But anyway, I would say that if you're not really sure what you wanna do, mm -hmm. keep your options open, go to a good college, a good liberal arts college, take the classes that you're best at, because honestly, most freshmen they might walk in with some idea in mind of what they want to do. They start taking classes and then they go, oh, wow, this is really cool. And yeah. something they never even thought about. So, I mean, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You're, you're going to like science if you're going to want to be a doctor. You're going to like, like biology. But um, probably have some allergies if you want to be an allergist. If you want to be an allergist. <laughs> but I would, I would say that doctors, um, for the most part, are interested in science and they're interested in people. Okay. And for the most part, you want to be a good people person, although you don't necessarily have to be a good people person. You can be a pathologist. You do need to be inquisitive, and you do need to be somewhat detailed. Yes. And um, so with your research... And you need to be able to work hard. Yes. And with all the research you did, I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like you were doing research before you even went to medical school, right? Um... Well, I was working for people who did research. I'm, right. not, I'm not sure I would say I did it. Right. But I did a little. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you found your interest. And then NIH was... Oh, you... NIH was total research. And wow. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, 
it was completely different from private practice. I, you know, I've been really lucky that I've liked everything that I've done. Yeah. Um, and they've all, they've all been different. And I'll say that one of the things that my husband used to tell me when I was at NIH is, is if you ever flunk out of research, the worst that's going to happen is you're going to at least double your salary. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't go into research for the money, for sure. You go in because you're inquisitive and you right. you want to answer questions and you want to help the world. And I find that, that that's why you're a better doctor, too, because I know with our family, we all always seem to have the unique thing. And um, versus a normal... You know, when I hear people say they went to their allergist, and I, I'm not putting down other doctors because they're all wonderful, but when I hear they went to an allergist, it's like they went to an allergist. When people go to you, you're like, well, did they do, you know, a 24-hour urine to look at this rare tumor? And people are like, what? You got that from an allergist? But really, a research person, allergist. <laughs> So, and in, how do I say it? In, Immuno, immunology, immunologist. So exactly what, doesn't, doesn't that entail more than just? Okay, so allergy. immunology yeah. is the way, um, refers to the way the cells in the body talk to each other. Okay. So our immune system. So our, our immune system is responsible for keeping us from getting infected mm -hmm. or for fighting infections. It's also, um, the system that um, sort of fights outdoor, outside um, intrusions into the bodies, shall we say. So when, when the immune system goes awry, we end up with things like rheumatologic diseases, mm -hmm. lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or we end up getting more cancers, wow. or we get infections more than we should, or you get allergies because the, you know, the immune right. system is doing things it shouldn't be doing. So... Um, People who train in allergy also train in immunology. The clinical part of it's really allergy. Okay. Um, but I'm interested in inflammation. That was what my research was. And so my partners and I are very interested in the immune system as well. Awesome. So we see a lot of immune deficient patients. Mm -hmm. So when did you start your partnership? How long after medical school? Oh, okay. So I got out of medical school in 78. Uh -huh. and did my fellowship, uh -huh. and then went to the NIH in 84. Okay. Stayed there until 93, and then my partner, Mike Callender, and I left at that time and opened up the Institute for Asthma and Allergy. Wow. So initially we were down in D.C., Uh huh. Um, and we were there until just before 9-11, so left in July of 2001. Wow. And we've been um, out in the Maryland suburbs since that time. Okay. So the Institute is 26 years old. Wow. And in Chevy Chase, too. Yes. Wheaton and Chevy Chase. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so what else do you want to tell us about your journey that you feel is really exciting that you think people should know or that would make them better doctors? Ah. Um, well, what are the roles that, that I've played in the Institute? Not only um, was starting our research center in running that for most of my career. Um, but I've also been very active in teaching the staff. So if you want, I would say for anybody who wants to go into medicine, mm -hmm. and actually this is true no matter what you do, whether it's medicine or something else, if you've right. got people working for you, personal feeling is you should know how to do their jobs, or at least know enough to be able to teach them. Mm. Um, and teach them to do it the way you want it done. Because I can guarantee if you don't do that, it's going to be done the way that you don't want it to be done. Makes um, sense. Put a smile on your face. Say please and thank you. Don't order people around. Say, would you mind doing this such and such? Yeah. Um, because a happy staff makes your patients happy and makes your day much better. That's true. And if you're ordering people around, they're not going to be happy. No. <laughs> the worst advice I think I ever got Mm -hmm. was from a, one of my professors in medical school. Okay. Uh, when I wrote on, a, on um, a test, I don't know. Oh. And he came to me, he said, don't you ever admit that you don't know. Huh. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I had ever heard. 
I agree. Uh, my advice would be for anybody going into medicine is if you don't know, say, I don't know. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll refer you to somebody who does know. But don't fake it. Um, be willing to admit that if this one's over my head, we need somebody else to, to answer this question. And that's why so many pediatricians send you out to, you know, specialists, allergists, ENTs, um, asthma and allergy doctors. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> right. Um, so back to your staff. So what I love about your staff is, and as far as you keep in control, when the doctor, uh, any of the doctors, because you have a lot of doctors at your office now, when the doctors are done, the nurse or assist, medical assistant, I'm not sure which, comes in and they have their piece of paper and you go over exactly what you want your patients to do. They're going to use an inhaler every time this happens. They're going to, you know, they're on antibiotic for a week and you are actually listing, they're writing, the parent is getting the form, it's all checked off and it's it's very organized. It's called a treatment plan. Yes. Yeah. And I love that because otherwise you go home and you're like, okay, I need to call the nurse. I don't remember. Like, I know the bottle says this, but was I supposed to do this before this or after that? Or <laughs> what? So I love... plans are very useful. And yes. we've actually, now that we've gone with electronic records, that's been actually incorporated into the notes. So I can just fill it out while I'm going and put the thing off. But wow. it does two things. It tells you exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Yes. And when you're, but we you also have, have a, a record child, when we're looking you, at your record. Like, oh. We know what you. We know exactly yeah. what we've instructed you to do because there it is. Yeah. The doctor who gets the note, the pediatrician, the internist, whatever they know. Yeah. So I, I find them enormously helpful. One Especially with teenagers when they say the doctor didn't say that, and you're like, yes, you the know, doctor yes, did. did. Here, here it is. <laughs> That's right. Oh, when dad brings the kids in, and I know mom's going to have a million. Yes. Questions. There you go. <laughs> Hand it to her. <laughs> here it is. We but, did have a lot of that. But, you know, the, one of the things that I think is really important for, for doctors to do is teach their patients. Um, you sure. know, so often we decide what should happen. We scribble it on a piece of paper and say, do that. But I think if patients don't know why they're doing something, mm -hmm. then they're far less likely to actually do it. This is true. Um, or if it doesn't seem to be working right away, they're going to stop unless they understand how the medicine works. So when we first opened up the Institute, we got people from all over the country who came in um, because their asthma was out of control. Right. And oftentimes they had been prescribed appropriate medications. They simply weren't taking them. And if you ask somebody what medicine they're taking without being judgmental so that they're willing to tell you, well, I'm supposed to take this, but I'm not, Mm. Um, and then get a better understanding of why they're not taking what they have had prescribed, you can address those issues. Right. So for instance, um, somebody on nasal sprays who won't take their nose spray, well, why not? Because it tastes terrible. Okay, I can fix that. Let's, let's change to one that you like. Right. Um, or I'm not taking my asthma inhaler. Why? Because it doesn't work right away. It's not supposed to. So if... If you go over why people are supposed to do what they're supposed to do and how the medicines work, right? like this one's a preventative. It works slowly. It's like putting on a raincoat. It doesn't make you better. It just keeps you from getting wet. Right. Um, you get that aha moment, mm -hmm. and then they start taking it. So I, I, I think that that's sense. just absolutely essential is to teach your patients. Don't be afraid to let them know as much as you know. Right. Makes sense. Definitely. Well, it's been very exciting talking to you. Uh, I think we shared a lot. If there's anything in particular you want to tell the teens out there, um, I guess internships are important. Uh, so they Internships are important. Uh, if you are interested in medicine, actually, no matter what you're interested in, if you want to keep your options open, work hard in school, have fun too, but work hard in school, keep your grades up, and keep your grades up in college because that really keeps your options open. Whether it's medicine, whether you decide you want to do something in engineering, you want to do something in theater, you want to do whatever, if you have decent grades and decent recommendations from those teachers who gave you nice grades, your options are going to be so far more open. Um, Makes sense. So that's, 
that's important and go, and go with your passion. And some say if they start out in, uh, like let's say the light goes on, mm -hmm. the juniors or seniors, and now they're like, oh my gosh, I wish I wasn't playing football every day or I wasn't a cheerleader every day. I wish I was getting a 4.0. What if they start out in a community college? Like let's say they want to be a vet with a vet tech program or a medical research program, uh -huh. and then they branch off to the four-year school and then you know obviously pick up the pace grade wise and research wise. Well what I would say is that you because sometimes they don't know you, when you they're can still young get, making mistakes. You can still get good grades in in um, junior college yeah. and even if you didn't get good grades in junior college and then the light came on and you decided oh I want to do more than this and start getting good enough to be able to move on to a four-year college Admission departments are much more interested in somebody who has an upward trajectory of grades than someone who has a downward traje trajectory. Ah. So they're they're not going to be particularly interested in somebody who made straight A's as a freshman and now is making straight C's as a yeah. junior. Yeah. The opposite, though, is going to be a more interesting person. Just be sure that when you do that essay, that you include why, that you acknowledge what happened. Uh huh. Um, and they're going to find this very interesting. I'm always lecturing teens yeah. on that essay. A acknowledge that, okay, I messed around my freshman year, but then right. decided, hey, I, I want to do more. And now I'm working hard and right. I plan to continue and I'm motivated. Very good advice. So make it personal. Yes. Well, thank you so, so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And to all of you out there that think you cannot become a doctor, you can. You just have to want it, and it has to be your passion. And if you have allergies, go see Dr. White. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we have Carla Ward and Christine James now, and Mike is retired. Ah, okay, okay. Yep, uh, Dr. Lee is really good, and he's from China too, right? He's or from he China. Or he's in China, and he he's speaks from fluent English. These, uh, these two are, are um, Hopkins trained. Ah, so when I was at the NIH, the Hopkins group was uh, one of my closest friendly rivals uh, in the particular area of immunology. See, I knew I was he was good and I didn't even know mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Economides is from UCLA. Ah, wow. So yeah, they have impressive fairly, backgrounds, right? Uh, fairly academic practice. They're all interested in research. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. So this is career three. <laughs> and I will say that white coat is about the only time I ever wore a white coat was for that picture. I take care of children, and they a lot of them just really get scared of white coats. So, um, so that's the thing, white coat syndrome? The suit that I'm dressed in right now, it's yes. so that I can sit on the floor and take care of babies, because oh, they don't always want to stand up for me. Right. And um, I started wearing suits because it gets hot and cold, and I can peel and or, or add, but uh, I never wear white jackets. So. Yeah. That's my advice to, to people going to medicine, too. Don't, don't feel like you have to look like a doctor. That's good Just advice. have to act like one. Right, exactly. Well, thank you so, so much. This is great. I'm Mary Ann Gonzalez, the producer of Dr. Libby's World of Medicine and Teen Say. Dreams do come true. Mary Ann with Teen Say. David Culver from NBC4. Peggy Fox with WUSA9. Wow! You didn't sleep. You know, pediatricians uh. want you to sleep. Like, <laughs> what is it, nine hours a night? Today we're going to hear from families that have lost loved ones. And it's horrible that the people that have committed suicide don't get that second chance. Don't get that new beginning. I have found that the schools know about concussions because of the trainers there and they're they know right away that the kids need accommodations. I find that with stay home moms that are doing incredible work to help you guys achieve your goals which is phenomenal because you're the future leaders of America right? Because we see you on all those cheer movies I mean they make cheerleaders look like drama yes. queens and kings right? And you're like oh my god do they cheer or is it all like... <laughs> <laughs> all right! This mom and dad? Yes ma'am, hello! Wow you've got Yes, we do. Lots of people love Tyler. Yeah. And that's what kids forget, and that's what adults forget. We're here at the Pride Parade in Washington, D.C. with... 
Daniel yeah, Trejo. Tell us what your outfit stands for. Oh, this is a basically represents freedom, you know, and nature and freedom. A feeling game, a word game to get the show going, warm everybody up so everybody's not so quiet. So I'm going to say a word. Marissa's going to say a word. You're going to say the first thing that comes to mind when we come to you. You know, I have a son who had heart surgery. He wanted desperately to play football, like, uh, you know, just begged. Well, then the parent says, you know what? They said no football. You're not playing football. You know, you have to put your foot down. So tell us about so. the electric eel. Now that you've been <laughs> there for five times, can you get through it without getting shocked? Because I heard a military man say, he, uh, he said, wow. I think this one just says, I have to prove something. <laughs> I don't know to who because it hurt. Yeah. <laughs> you took vitamins. Put, put up your hands. Great. Yeah. Was that recommended by the hospital or head to head? Head to head. head, to head. head, to head. Okay. We How big is your school? We only have 700 um, until 800 students. Wow, that was awesome. No wonder they're the state champs. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Let's hear you. Yay. Yeah, I'm very excited about this app. This sounds incredible. I'm going to roll a video real quick, if you don't mind, sure, to see what this is all about. That and then we'll good. get to it. Hey, awesome. Today we're doing an awesome special on Get Off the Couch, Shut the Computer. Hey, hey, I just met you. And this is crazy. But here's our number. Don't call me maybe. It's hard to look right at your baby. But here's our number. So call me. 